So tomorrow you're going to have a sub. You're not going to be here. You're not going to have a sub. Gold's going to have a sub. Okay. <coughs> so uh, if you are somebody that comes in and streams second hour, that's not going to be happening. They're going to be watching this video tomorrow if they're in class. Okay. So fourth hour, I will record my lecture for tomorrow's lecture. So you won't be able to come in live. Sorry, those of you that do. Okay. You'll have the weekend to watch the video. Okay. For the next next one. Okay. Uh, but I, I should be back for fourth hour. So we're recording in the afternoon. Sound good? Okay. Uh, I've continued to work on uh, book reviews. Uh, grade a few more. Uh, start seeing those pop up. Uh, I think actually quite a few of you in here have graded yours. So, um, yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Um, glad y'all made it safe this morning. And we're going to pick up where we left off in our discussion of Congress, the yeah. legislative branch. Okay. We got through uh, gerrymandering in the last elect, uh, the last lecture. Remember gerrymandering? Wait, what is the definition? Uh, basically, the definition is drawing congressional districts to favor one party over another. Is it undemocratic? Well, the seats are proportioned based on population, and the elected leaders that are democratically elected in the state legislatures uh, get to make the decisions for us, which is representative, not democratic. They were chosen democratically, they're representatives. So they make those decisions for us. And whoever's in the majority, wins. Or whoever wins the most elections wins the majority and they win. And if they stay in power for the entire time and even they are administering it, is that Democrat that we elect? Well, if we keep electing them, it is. But if we can't not? What? What if we can't not elect them? What do you mean you can't not elect them? They're administering the entire Oh, so they secure their, themselves. Well, that's the thing. So, if you feel like Ron Estes is ignoring you, and you're a Republican, you're going to be like, hey, Ron, we're going to gang up against you, and we're going to vote for a different candidate because you're not representing us here. That's our job. Keep them honest. Yes? Moving on. Okay? Now, because every two years we get to make that decision. Uh, I talk about these delegates. Okay? Uh, they can participate in debate. But they can't vote. They can vote in a committee, but they can't vote on the full floor. Okay, these uh, delegates that represent territories and DC. Okay, uh, so now I would like you to look at your textbook. That's not really a textbook. Your book, uh, page seventy-four. Because we're going to talk about leadership. Okay, and we're talking about the House, so we'll talk about House leadership first. 74. See the pictures? Okay. This is a great page, okay, uh, that I put together for you. Okay. Um, so let's start with the House, which is in the bottom half of page 74, okay? So the Speaker of the House is no longer John Boehner, right? That's what I have in the notes. That's wrong. He's retired, okay? It's Nancy Pelosi, yes? So you can fix that at home. All right. And then, um, okay, so what kind of powers? And I, I referenced this, guys, the other day. Nancy Pelosi or the Speaker of the House is like a dictator in the House. Nothing happens. Remember when we talked about how Tim Hewell's camp was on the Agriculture Committee and he ticked off John Boehner? Yeah, he got kicked off the committee, okay? So the, the Speaker, uh, when the House is in session, no one can speak unless given permission. Okay, now what they use, guys, on um, in the House and Senate is something called parliamentary procedure. Any of you guys aware of parliamentary procedure and how that works? Okay, this is something that when I was in school, you know, back to elementary and middle and high school, we used to talk about parliamentary procedure. And so basically, when they are debating on the on the floor of the House or Senate, 
they do not address each other individually. They address each other through the chair or through the president of the House. So if I want to talk to Sam I w- or, or criticize Sam or say something positive about Sam, and I'm a member of the House, he's a member of the House, I would say, Mr. President, my colleague from Kansas has it wrong. Okay, so I don't address you. I address you through the chair. Does that make sense? This prevents, you know, bickering. There's rules to how you speak. You have to be recognized in order to speak. Okay, and you are generally record recognized for a certain amount of time. And if you go beyond that time, you're going to hear the gavel, and they're going to say your time has expired. Now, if I have two minutes to talk, and I would, and I'm only going to talk for a minute. I can yield one minute of my time to Ashley. Okay, so I would say to the president, Mr. President, I'd like to yield one minute of my time to the representative from Kansas, Ashley Mall. Okay, and then you would have a minute. Okay, so this makes the debate on the floor function. Now, there is no debate unless Nancy wants there to be a debate. Okay, so. The speaker interprets and applies the rules. Okay. And then decides which committees bills go to. All right. So now this is where things get a little tricky. You would think a bill that had something to do with transportation would automatically be sent to the transportation committee. Yes, but that's not always the case. Let's say Nancy and the chair of the Transportation Committee, which is another Democrat, so generally they're going to get along. But let's say they don't see eye to eye on this bill. Nancy Pelosi could send this transportation bill to any other committee she wanted. It doesn't necessarily have to go to that specific committee. So if she's friends with the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, she can send this transportation bill to the Ways and Means Committee, where the, the person, the, the chair of that committee says, you know, I don't like this bill. It'll never see the light of day. Okay, so really she controls every piece of legislation introduced into the House. She controls its fate. If Nancy doesn't like it, it's not going anywhere. Period. That's the power of the speaker. Okay, the majority leader in the Senate has similar power, so I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay, she assigns members, and so we talked about the Tim Hules camp situation, where you know if she don't, if you don't get along with the speaker, you don't vote with the speaker, you don't do what the speaker wants, you may lose your committee assignment that you really like or that is important to your district. Okay, okay. the speaker, all members are not required to vote when there's a vote. Okay. Especially like, say, Nancy Pelosi was running for president. She was out campaigning, and there was a vote on the floor, and she wasn't there. you got to be present to vote. You see that a lot in senators that are running for president. So, like, in the last um, go-around in 2020, I mean, like, Elizabeth Warren was a senator. Cory Booker was a senator. Um, Elizabeth Warren was a senator. So these people missed a lot of votes. Does that make sense? Because they weren't there. Nancy is required to vote, okay, if it will create or break a tie vote. <clears throat> Under the rules, she has to vote in those situations, okay? Some people don't vote because they don't want to make a tough decision. So some people vote present instead of yes or no. Get off the fence, right? Right? Okay. So that is some of the roles of the speaker, okay? Any questions on that? Okay. Guess I covered that well. Did I misspell committees? What's going on there? Just they didn't like it, or okay. Then you have your majority leader. Okay, so the majority leader in the house right now is a guy named Steny Hoya. Okay, and he's from Maryland. Okay, second most powerful person in the house. Yes. Do we need to know like the majority leader, minority leader, and them? Okay. You will need to know some of the leadership for the test. Okay, you're definitely going to need to know speaker, right? 
Um, you might want to know your majority minority leader. I don't think I'm going to ask you who the whips are. I won't ask you who the whips are. And then you need to know your three from Kansas, yes? Okay, Marshall, Moran, and Essence. Okay. All right. So the minority leader is, I, I, or excuse me, major, why do I, yeah, majority, is a legislative strategist, okay, really works to help the speaker, okay? Um, so they work together, say, okay, what bills are we going to bring up this month or in the first quarter of the year? Uh, what are we going to hold off on? What do you think we can get past? That sort of thing, okay? So they work together. It's kind of uh, the speaker's right-hand person, okay? Um, and then um, once the bill is sent to the floor, they kind of try and, you know, work the room and, and get people to help out, okay? Uh, the minority leader is the head of the minority party, and that is Kevin, uh, Kevin McCarthy of California for the Republicans, okay? Guys, it stinks being in the minority. Okay, if you or Ron asked us today, you have a really good idea for a bill that would help, you know, businesses or help people or what have you. Chances are, any piece of legislation that's proposed by a Republican probably doesn't have a very good chance in that. House. It just, it, it stinks. I remember when Todd T. Hart was our representative and he came and talked to, um, talk to our seniors in the auditorium and he talked about just how awful it is being in the minority so like he's on a committee but he said the committee chair won't even listen to him you know because it's a democrat and they're like mm, nah i don't have to listen to you okay so you know you show up and you vote and it's hard to pass any legislation if you're in the minority okay but what is the the Party leader, the minority leader's job is to kind of keep his caucus together, um, to work hard to, uh, you know, get the Republicans to be on the same page. Okay, um, and of course he is going to work with the speaker and the Democratic side as well. There'll, there'll be in discussions, there'll be in meetings, and so forth. Okay, then you have your whips. Okay, um, have you ever heard the phrase like uh, twisting somebody's arm to get them to do something? Okay, this is what whips do, all right? They uh, do the bidding of the speaker, all right? So, like, the majority whip, what, James Clyburn, is that right? Yeah, James Clyburn. Um, Clyburn will uh, try and convince members of the Democratic caucus to vote a certain way, all right? Look, the speaker really wants you to vote yes on this. I know you may not like this, but she really needs you to vote. Okay. The other thing they do, if Nancy needs to know how many votes she has for a particular piece of legislation, she'll ask the whip. The whip's job to know how many votes she has, because she doesn't want to lose a vote. That doesn't make the speaker look good when they lose. So Clyburn's supposed to know that number. So he's got to communicate with the other Democrats and Republicans, for that matter, to find out how many votes they're going to have. Okay. And then in the minority side, same thing, okay? To try and twist arms, uh, muscle, muscle the votes, um, and know how many votes. They're vote counters, okay? And then I mentioned the committee chairs, okay? These are of great importance. Obviously, in the House, all the committee chairs are of what party? Democrats. And all the committee chairs in the Senate are? Republicans, okay? So they are like the speaker over their committees, okay? They control the calendar, okay? Now, I think I talked about this the other day, but let me just go ahead and talk about it. So, um, so say we're talking about the Senate Judiciary Committee, okay? And let's say there's 27 members on that committee, okay? Because the Senate is 5347 right now, Republicans are going to have 14 seats. The Democrats are going to have 13. And the chair is going to be a Republican. Okay. In the House, where in the 116th Congress, the one we're in now, Democrats have a pretty big majority. So if we're in the House Judiciary Committee and say there's um, 37 seats, 
on that committee. Okay, the Democrats may have uh, what's after that? There's the uh, twenty three, sixteen. What were we at? Half. half. Okay, so we're going to go nineteen and sixteen. Democrats, Republicans, and the chair be a Democrat. Does that make sense? So the bigger your majority, the more seats you'll have on the committees. Yes? Proportional to the percentage in Congress. Good? Understand? Okay. Now, who gets on the committee? Who's the chair? Okay. Now, guys, Democrats use seniority a lot. So if you've been on that committee for two decades, and the chair retires from Congress. Well, you're next in line. Okay, you've been on the committee the longest. Okay, um, Republicans tend to hold elections for their committee chairs. Okay, so you want the most competent person to be your chair. Okay, with the Democrats, hmm, some of their committee chairs are not very competent. Okay, and if you watched the impeachment hearings, okay. Um, last year, okay, the committee chair for um, the uh, House Judiciary is Adam Schiff, okay, and then you know he's he's uh, arms he's so usually impeachment takes place in the judiciary, but it took place in Adam Schiff's committee because Jerry Nadler is the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and Jerry Nadler is. He's not with it very well. And so they put the impeachment hearings in a different committee. Okay. Um, and you can, I mean, you go back and watch some of those hearings and see Jerry Nadler. And, you know, it's just like, mm, okay. Not putting your best foot forward. Okay. So, guys, these committee chairs control the calendar of their committees. Okay. So if a bill is sent to your committee and the chair doesn't like it, they don't put it on the calendar. It sits on their desk. It's this. No, no, I don't like this. I'm just going to set that over there and ignore it. Okay, there's a political science term for that. It's called pigeonholing. Pigeonholing the bill. This, if you have 10,000 pieces of legislation introduced every two years, most of them wind up on a committee chair's desk, never put on a calendar. Yeah. Is there any way to like prevent these abuses? Okay, so there is something called um, I've got it. I don't know why it's not coming to my head right now. Um, they can ask for the whole body can ask for the bill to be removed, removed out of the committee and sent to a different committee. Um, but it takes a majority vote of the, the House of Representatives. There's no way for the to actually put anything up. They can put it up. Now, if Nancy likes something that a Republican puts up, you know, it can pass. And every now and again, again guys, there's legislation that both sides agree on. Usually, like things like helping veterans, you know what I mean. So both parties would generally join in on that sort of thing. You know what I mean. So if a Republican says, um, "Let's have more accountability in the VA system, the veterans hospital situation," okay? Um, yes, it's very hard to fire a government employee because they have union protections, they have lawyers that protect them, okay? And there were horror stories coming out of our veterans hospitals that there were long waiting periods, that we had veterans that were dying, waiting for an appointment, waiting for care, okay? And uh, this is, whether you like Trump or not, this is one of the best things he did as president, is they passed the VA Accountability Act to say that if you work at a VA hospital and you're an administrator and you're ignoring these veterans and they're dying, waiting for appointments, you can be fired for that, okay? And so... They did away with some of the protections that these employees had by the unions, okay? 
and said, look, if they uh, are negligent, they can be fired. So it's accountability, all right, which we don't have a lot of accountability, accountability in our government. So before that, if you're like an intern almost at, at, at a government office, you can't be fired? An intern? Like a secretary, someone who just sits in a chair and is there for the people every day. It's hard to fire you. How difficult? Okay, so there's a process, right, to fire somebody. Now, if I screw up my job here at Bishop Carroll, I get an annual contract, and they say, Ebright did something horrible in class, okay? Or let's say I had an inappropriate relationship with a student. Okay, that's going to get you fired, okay? In the public schools, um, inappropriate relationship with a student is going to get you fired. That's probably the quickest thing to get you fired, easiest way to get you fired. Because the teachers' unions tend not to protect you on that. The, the, the union lawyers, you follow me? They're like, mm, we can't really defend that. <laughs> That's totally inappropriate. But if you're snorting cocaine at your desk and you get caught, guys, drug abuse is a disease. So the lawyers are going to try and get you into rehab. You're not going to lose your job. Okay, Guys, they literally have hundreds of teachers in New York City as we speak today that they do not want in a classroom. But because the process of firing a teacher in New York City is so difficult and is so expensive, they just send them to a building with other teachers that they don't want in classrooms. They have to report, you know, at 8 a.m. They get to leave at 3 o'clock. They do nothing. But they can't fire them. But they don't want them anywhere near school children. That seems completely ridiculous. It is completely ridiculous. <laughs> Look, guys, if you want if you want a good pension, you want a situation where you're not accountable for performing good job performance, go to work for the federal government. Go work for the government. You don't have to do anything. Have you guys ever watched the show Parks and Recreation? I love that show. It's okay. So funny. Now, I, I've only watched a couple of episodes, but that's a good example of, you know, uh, in government employees that are protected by a union, and they're not generally held accountable for... And they should have been fired ages ago. <laughs> somebody on the show? Yeah. Oh, every single one of them. Okay, well... <laughs> it, guys, it's, it's the way it works. Is it uh, decent pay at least, though? Depends on where you're at. Like, look, cops don't make a lot of money. Firefighters don't make a lot of money. You're a public servant. What's the second part of that word? Servant. Servant. Servants don't make as much money. Okay. Teachers are public servants. Okay. So if you're going into education because you think you're going to get rich, no, you're not going to get rich. I knew that when I became a teacher. I said, well, I'm going to be working for somebody else. Okay. Now I have accountability here. Now, You know there are really good teachers here, and then there's some. Okay, it's hard to get people to work here sometimes. Okay, because the pay, okay, the benefits are not the same as if you go over to Northwest. They're just not. Okay, um, now generally, if you're a bad teacher, uh, the principal will try and get rid of you and send you to a different school and make you somebody else's problem. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's what happens in 259. They just ship them to different schools. Okay. Um, same with the principals. Oh, Athletic directors. They get shifted around to different schools. I'm like, I can't do this. This person's, you know. I love how we're talking about all of this. And it's like, Dude, it's insane. It's insane. Power? It's insane. Okay. Now, this system is set up by them over the years. There's 200 years of precedent here um, of how these, sy these systems work, okay? Um, now, just like we talked about you know, early on in this class, guys, this is a system of mutual frustration. It's not supposed to work efficiently, okay? If this process was really easy to pass laws, we would have a lot more laws. And laws, a lot of times, are restrictions on your what? So this is a good thing. 
in some ways. Frustrating as heck? Absolutely. It's called gridlock. Okay? And we're going to, you know, if the Republicans win one of those two seats in the Senate, we're going to have gridlock the next two years. Unless there's common ground that they can, come, you know, come up with. Look at this. I mean, we've been talking about this next spending bill for COVID relief for months. Okay? Republicans say, we're willing to do this. Democrats say, we want this. This. Republicans saying, we're willing to do this. They haven't been able to come together. Okay? And who needs their help? We do. Small businesses, unemployed people need their help. But they're playing politics. Yeah. If, if you're a secretary, it depends where you're at. I mean, like if you're a secretary for a member of Congress, you know, when they lose, you, you know, I mean, that member of Congress can fire you because he hired you. Okay. But if you work for the system, it's hard to fire. So if you're a secretary at the Department of Defense and you just work there, okay, it's hard to fire. If you work for the TSA, Transportation Security Administration, uh, the airport, it's hard to fire you. Yes, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Can you explain the military or, um, here and then just the power down from the speaker down to the committee? Yeah. Um, well, your leadership just has a lot of power, right? So. Um, if you're especially if you're in the majority okay um and these other people like steny hoyer the majority leader um other members need to curry favor with them okay so that 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 adds to their power but as far as controlling the flow of legislation right at the top okay it starts with the speaker and the committee chairs Okay, they they have basically veto power over every piece of legislation. So speakers and then your committee chairs. I would say your committee chairs are more powerful than standing board. You know what I mean? Because they control the calendar. So speaker and committee and then the majority and then the minority. Yeah, yeah. The minority minorities just really only have power over <coughs> their caucus. Their you know the the Republicans in the House. Okay. All right, so let's move over to the Senate, okay? Quite in fact, it's a lot different, guys, okay? First of all, their term. How long are their terms? Six in the Senate, okay? Now, there's only two from each state, so you have 100 members, okay? Now, how many terms can senators uh, serve? Mm -hmm. As many as they want, as many as they can get reelected, okay? Now, I'll just tell you a quick story. Um, Strom Thurmond was a senator from South Carolina. In 1948, Strom Thurmond ran for president as a Dixiecrat. He broke away from the Democratic Party, started a third party. Okay? He didn't win any electoral college votes. But about 1968, he switched over to the Republican Party, and he was elected to the Senate from South Carolina. Okay? Strom Thurmond died in 2004, I believe, maybe 2006, at the age of 100. He was reelected at the age of 98. Okay, interesting guy. Now, I told you this guy was originally a segregationist, yes? Because he was a Dixiecrat. Are you following me here? Yes. When he died at the age of 100, his mistress that he had had relations with back in the 1960s and his love child from that relationship came forward. What was interesting is that his mistress was an African-American woman and his daughter was an African-American woman. Now, his mistress was in her 70s and his daughter was in her 50s. They never told anybody about this. Relationship. 
relationship until he died. He took care of her. Like, he gave her alimony and paid for his daughter's college and had a little bit of a relationship with her growing up and stuff. Was but she was 70 when he died? His, yeah. 30 years? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wait. Well, if he, was, if he was in his 60s or 50s, she would have been in her 20s or 30s. Or That's well, you, guys, you guys don't happened. think that happened? Wait, we don't. We know it happened. Wait, how many years? 30. I think it was close to 30 years. She was in her She was in her 70s. And wait, she was in her 70s and he was 100? Yes. Yeah. Well, they never told me anybody. It's pretty interesting. Strong Thurman. Interesting guy. Guy. Segregation is elected for like. Well, he changed his views. Did so, I mean, Democrats have members like, like uh, Robert Byrd served for a long time. He was a member of the Klan and ended up being the Senate Majority Leader in, in the 90s. Okay. I forgot what but there is a Okay. It'll come to you. Okay. So, now, guys, in 2020. Oh, I remember. Okay. Wait, did he have a wife? Yes. Well, she, he was a widower. Oh. But at the time, he had a wife when he had his affair. Wow. Right. What? You don't think that happens? That's like, I'm just giggling. Okay. Actually, don't go outside. All right. In 2020, only one third of the Senate was up for re election. Okay. So. Pat Roberts' seat, where he was retiring in Kansas, was up for election, but Jerry Moran's seat is not up until 2022. And in 2024, oh, the last 34 will be up for election. So it's a contiguous body. Only one third of the Senate is up every two years for election. Does that make sense? So at any given time, you have 66, 67 members of the Senate that have at least two years of experience and have been working with the other members. They're supposed to add to the, you know, the cooperation of the Senate. Now, and when you look at this, guys, in the Senate, they tend to be a little bit more moderated than in the House. So in the House, you have some radicals, you know, on the left and right. You have some radicals, okay? In the Senate, you tend not to have as many radicals. There are a few, okay? Um, but they tend to be more moderate. Because these people have to win statewide elections. So you're not going to, it's, I don't know. I don't know if you'd ever see like AOC, if she stays on her kind of her trend that she's on now, ever winning a Senate seat in, in New York. I mean, it's possible. But I, you know, I just don't think, when you get to the more left wing or right wing that you get these people. And, and a perfect example is here in Kansas, right? I mean, when you looked at Chris Kobach, right, who failed at the gubernatorial run and was running for the Senate, the Republicans in this state said he's too right wing. He's not going to get elected. So they went with Roger Marshall, who's more moderate. Does that make sense? You guys understand this stuff, man, right? Especially since you read these political books and stuff, you, I mean, you start to get a pretty good idea of what's going on, you know, in the system. Yeah. My biggest problem is that, like, is it with how it takes forever to do a law? We make a law. It just has to do with how grossly incompetent and corrupt everyone is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I can't. I can't help you. I don't. I don't know what to say. I mean, we get a vote. We get to vote for three of them. Are our people pretty good? I, I mean, I think our people are pretty good. I mean, um, I'm like, you know, Ron Estes is incompetent. You may disagree with some of his politics. Jerry Moran is a moderate guy. Uh, and Marshall, maybe a little bit more conservative than Moran, but he's no right wing wacko. Yeah. Oh, I know. Like, last time we talked about like like a tipping point with the economy. And I know, like, when the election was getting really heated, a lot of people talked about um, 
Victoria, Maria, you're going to be watching this lecture tomorrow in class. I hate to waste your time. So um, I'm going to be gone, so they're going to, and I'm going to record fourth hour tomorrow. So I'm going to be gone second hour. Sub's going to show this. So, I mean, you can work on something else tomorrow if you want to stay in here. That's fine. Okay. But I'll see you guys on Monday, I guess. Monday. Monday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I'm sorry. I, I Will there be another okay. civil war is this question. Okay. What would cause that? What? I mean, you say economic. I'm sure it would be incredibly difficult because, like, the state would have to split in between the Republicans and Democrats. The Democrats outnumber the Republicans, but they're concentrated in the cities. Right, and Republicans have more guns. <laughs> Hey, That's listen, let, let me ask you this. Okay. But they're like, hey. every state has at least like, um, at least one or six Republicans. I, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. The country, the countryside is full of Republicans. The suburbs is full of Republicans. Now, let me, let me just, let me just uh, throw this out there. Okay. I don't know how much you guys have been paying attention. Okay. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. But. How many guys legitimately feel that, based on what you've heard, that there was enough corruption in this last election that this election might have been stolen from Donald Trump? How many guys think that, that there was I, enough mail-in ballots? Donald and, Trump. Huh? I wouldn't give it to Biden, but I wouldn't give it to Donald Trump. I'm not asking what you would give. Do you think there was enough corruption? Okay. Okay. Well, if you look at polls that are going off right now about this, and we know about the polls, right? But it, it is interesting to look at. Okay. Over 70% of Republicans feel that this election was stolen. 70%. And if you ask Democrats, about 30% feel that there was there was significant cheating in this election. Does that mean that, like, we have a majority who think we can cheat? You have, you have a majority of the American people that feel there was a lot of fishiness in this election and that it needs to be fixed. Well, okay, really four cities. Okay, Atlanta, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and Detroit. <coughs> where they shut down counting around 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and then ballots started showing up. The fact that they didn't allow observers and, you know, Republican observers in these rooms when these ballots were being counted, they were kicked out. Um, there's been hearings in Arizona and Michigan this week uh, of people coming forth and testifying about these irregularities about UPS trucks showing up from New York with 250,000 ballots into Philadelphia. The UPS driver testified that he delivered 250,000 ballots from New York. Okay. I don't know, I think it's a whole other election for the entire country, just because it's election. No, I, no my, I think my point was, you asked about a civil war. If something like this, and if there's real proof that comes out, you know what I mean? Because a lot of this, it's just, it's not something you can put into, you know, a couple of paragraphs and say, this yeah. is what happened. And so, <clears throat> unless you could do that, you're not going to convince, you know. Now, some of this is going to wind up in front of the Supreme Court, maybe this week, next week. And if uh, Trump's lawyers can put this in a cohesive way, that the Supreme Court sees real fraud, uh, like with these voting machines, okay, um, you could see a situation, okay, where, hold up a minute, something needs to be fixed. There needs to be an audit, okay. Um, but 
it's it's the mail-in stuff. We we've, we've never done it like this before. You know what I mean? And so it really creates an opportunity for fraud, for cheating. Now I don't know. I don't know. I'm suspicious of Philadelphia for sure. And if you look at some of the turnout, you know, 100% turnout is crazy, right? Of registered voters. Some of these have 120% turnout in some of their cities, which is statistically impossible. And you have a lot of statisticians that are looking at this election saying, this is, this is off. Something's wrong. Okay. Now, do you believe these people? I don't know. Okay. But you're not hearing any of this on any media, including Fox News. I'm just saying that Trump's going to be lost. Voter fraud is wrong. There is no voter fraud. There's none? No, like, the first vote you were there. Like, you oh, there. yeah. There's none. Which is ridiculous. Okay. The, the only place you're going to see this finest, guys, is on Twitter. Okay. That's the only place you're going to see. Or you're going to hear some from President Trump because he tweets it. Okay. But, guys, yeah, you're not going to see any media. On Twitter, okay, and I follow. I'm following the Trump lawyers, and they're posting all this stuff. I mean, there's been hearings. Like the state legislature in Michigan yesterday had a hearing. They had witnesses that came forward, risking their, really risking their own personal safety, to come forward and testify. And two of them I saw yesterday were African African American women that were in Detroit, and saying this. They were cheating. So you have a ballot that's, that has somebody that voted for Biden and another candidate. And they like, well, what do we do with this? Well, we're supposed to throw it out. Well, let's just give it to Biden. She watched that happen. Okay. Um, so it, it's, you know, I, my point, and I got off track here, was if this doesn't cause, you know, civil unrest, and if there's enough they're there, um, then what won't? What will? Now, maybe t try and take away people's Second Amendment rights. You know, like gun confiscation. I think you might have a civil war on your hands. You know what I mean? I think people will make a big fuss about it, <laughs> but they won't really care. I feel like. Oh, now no, no, you're going to get resistance on guns. Yeah. yeah I feel like you're going to get resistance, just not nearly as much as resistance. Armed resistance. <laughs> I don't want people to guard people. Yeah. 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 If the government knows you have a gun, then they know where to find it when they want to take it away. Yeah. And another, another thing with this is somebody, somebody's argument on the other side was because like, because the government's military is so like overpowered yeah. compared to like your just puny little shop. Yeah. It's like not well, well, part of the thing is you got to think about this, guys. The military are human beings too. They're going to come down on some of the military is going to come down on the side of the Second Amendment people. Some of them are going to, you know, list, come down on the other side. But which side do you think most of the military is going to come down? Your Second Amendment right or not? You know, you got to think about it. think about cops. Okay, cops have guns too, and so which side are they going to come down on this argument? Yeah, another page to do. Yeah, uh, we got off track there. Sorry. Hey, um, so Maria Victoria, if you saw this, you're good tomorrow in class. I'll just hang out and work on something else, okay? Okay, we'll see you later. I'll be going live tomorrow, fourth hour. That's for you guys, but you won't be able to. Yeah, you can come in. Yeah, fine.